And then I kind of found out that, you know, I thought, well, I'll just kind of do my art, but there was a lot more to this than just putting leather on a tree. Uh, and when I went to saddle schools, I wasn't really taught anything about anatomy. And I thought there was something missing. So it was kind of like painting on a bad canvas. I, I had to learn um, why I was doing the things I was doing. So I, that started me on this journey. And so 35 years later, I'm, I'm still on it. I'm still learning. Uh, at some point, I got hooked up with Dr. Deb Bennett, who's one of the world's leading experts on equine biomechanics. And she kind of introduced uh -huh. me to like Tom, Tom Dorrance and Ray Hunt and those guys. And, uh, you know, it's just been a really interesting journey. And if, with each step, I find a question and then I pound on that question until I get some answers. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm going to share with everybody here tonight is what were the questions and what did I find? And, and certainly the journey isn't over yet. <laughs> yeah, there's always, always kind of more to, more to, to all of this. So, well, awesome. So all of you out there, you know, if you have any questions, go on in, you know, as we get going here, start putting your questions in the chat area and then we'll try to get, uh, get to as many questions as we can, you know, as we're going along, um, you know, I'll, I'll read the question off for Dave uh, and then we'll see if we can get to as many of these questions as possible. And I know saddle fitting is kind of a huge issue everywhere I go, you know, people are always asking, well, you know, does this saddle fit and how do I, how do I know if it's fitting or not fitting or, you know, where do I get, go to get a saddle and all of those things. So, Dave, why don't you uh, help us out here and give us give us some of your answers? Okay. Um, well, so the first thing we kind of have to get a handle on is some of the history. And in all of us, we have the idea that there's only one way of fitting a saddle. And what I've found is there's like four very major different ways of fitting saddles. And they go back to the the very beginning of riding where we had two very different con we had two very different concepts one concept in the east and one concept in the west in the east people rode balance in the west meaning europe not western united states and east we're talking iran uh china africa those places kind of the way back you know Hundreds they of years ago. rode really braced. Oh, thousands. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're way back. So anyway, Cyrus the Great was one of the first great horsemen. He invented the Bozal. Um, they didn't have saddles yet, but he invented what we would call high school horsemanship. Okay. His, uh, he had a son named Darius. Darius had a son named Xerxes. Uh, Xerxes taught a guy known as Xenophon. So we, most of us know about Xenophon now uh, mm -hmm. and we read because he's, that's where the West started learning about the Eastern ways of horsemanship. So it's just really interesting to realize that all this good soft horsemanship that we talk about actually started in Iran. They started calling the way that they rode in the East Hineta. So these guys rode, um, very forward on the horse. Legs were fairly bent, but they rode in a balanced position. All right, so in the east, the saddles looked like this. Um, they had very broad bars or horse rails. I'm gonna call that a horse rail because that fit the horse. And the fronts of the saddles were really open. They were over the scapula, but they weren't on the scapula. So mm. this has been the most successful model in all of history. So most advanced horse cultures use this model where the saddle is up in the back, okay? Then we had two arches and then a seat rail. Now these guys rode um, in two point. They actually put conchos here so they couldn't sit because they wanted <laughs> to be riding on their legs, okay? So it was, a. I mean, they were good riders, but it, it would be tough for us to ride that way today. 
Yeah. Uh. These guys, they joisted. So they had big cannels. The legs were four bits. They had rowels that were over a foot long. Uh, um, well, I mean, this this like five inches long, and they were really pointy. Uh, you can see how the horse's back is really inverted here. Um, so their basic idea, um, they made chairs. Okay, when we look at this, we think, oh, look, there's the bar. But this part of this saddle did not touch the horse. Okay, so basically they here, and he basically had four points supporting the saddle. And you think, okay, well, that's jousting. What does it have to do with us today? Well, a lot of the Western saddles in the back and the pads in the front of the bar, and then they narrow the center of the bar really narrow. So these ideas are still living. Um, yeah, so that's, this is one idea of saddle fitting. So if you have an English saddle and you bring a stuffer out and they put more stuffing in the front and less in the middle, and more in the back and they tell you they do that so the horse can round up into it well they're actually following this model of saddle fitting yeah it's really interesting because uh just uh, two days ago i had a gal with her um saddle and she's just supposedly had it it fit and that's the way it was fit and it's an english saddle and you know it's just you, i could stick my hand in the middle there was so much gap and it, the press, pressure was on the back and on the front. Yeah, so we call that bridging. Yeah. Okay. So he's one of the really pivotal guys when it comes to saddle fitting. Um, here again, they, they were a horse culture. They rode very balanced, and they rode a long time. Um, they went up into Europe, and they just killed him. I mean, the guys in the jousting stuff, they couldn't compete. These guys would run in with the arrows, shoot them, and get out of there, okay? So at that point in time, everything kind of started meshing together, and um, the saddles started to change. So we've got like three parts of any saddle. We've got two arches, a seat rail, and then we have a rail that fits the horse. These jousting saddles didn't have that. But they started looking at what Genghis Khan saddles looking looked like, and they the tabs started getting shorter, and the seat rail started going lower. So when you see this shape on the bottom of your saddle, that means that it has the heavy influence from the Breda or the jousting saddles. Okay, so the two worlds mesh. The guys get killed by the other guys, and they say, hey, maybe we should start adopting some of their riding ideas. And a third seat came into being called Estriota. Um, this is also called the bastard seat. Okay, this is actually what most of us ride today. And it can be good or bad depending on what we do with our bodies. What time frame kind of did that come in? Oh, this is, um, you know, I'm not sure, about 1300s, 1300s, 1400s. Okay. It'd be about when that, here again, the rider rode for, yeah, the rider rode forward, and they really knew how to cinch up a saddle too. And notice that the cinch is far back. It's not in what we call the girth groove. That's a new thing. Nobody ever used to put their girths in the girth groove. Okay, hmm. so these of horse history. Then around the 1850s, 1900s, the British came up with a new seat and this is what most of us follow today so if you look we back the legs are forward they're very braced the horses are braced okay the guy that wrote this book riding and hunting so he wrote this book and in this book it talks about saddle fitting the ideas that are in this book are what most saddle companies most saddle fitters are following okay so this is where the idea that you put the saddle back behind. interesting to note that this English saddle tree was not really designed to fit the horse it's the framework for the seat put into perspective a lot of what you're hearing from saddle fitters the worst model that's ever been in human history for how to fit a saddle 
This is a seat. So this is a seat rail. They broadened it out in the back a little bit. They used to also change the angle of the saddle um, up here instead of up here. And that was a good thing. So we got three essential parts of any saddle, the arches. So on a Western saddle, we call that the front and the cantle. Um, we have the horse rail and on a seat rail. Now on a Western saddle, the seat rail is right on top of the horse rail. On an English saddle, we have the front arch, we have the rear arch, and the rest of the tree is a seat rail. Okay, so an English saddle tree is the framework for the seat, and the horse rails are the panels we put underneath. Um, here's a real classic military saddle where we have the horse rail designed to fit the horse. Then we have two arches, one in the front and the back, and then we have webbing that webs between those. So we see these separate ideas of fitting the horse and fitting the person because they're two different shapes. And when you get that concept, you can kind of start making sense of what's going on out there. So here's three different trees. This is one of my tree. This is one of my trees. See, it's very wide in the middle. This is a wade tree. They're working off the pad in the back and the pad in the front and asking Tom Dorrance about what I was doing. And this was what he wanted the wade to do. Um, they got a little bit of that going on the wade. This one over here, you see there again, there's the pad concept. Those are all gonna put pressure on the front and the back and right in the middle where, you, where all the weight, you'd want the weight. So I wanna show you this one here. This is a Japanese saddle. And this was like the first flexible panel system. They had these two, I think, well, there's a bar to fit the horse. That did not touch the horse. That was a seat rail. That was just to, for the rider to rest on. So then they had these flexible panels that um, they put underneath the saddle. But in any flexible panel system, you end up with four points. This one, because this is what happened after Genghis Khan came up. We still had a seat rail, but then we started going with a wide horse rail to fit the horse. Okay, so here's like the two big competing ideas about how to fit a saddle. The Eastern concept is going to move the saddle forward. It's going to be over the top of this muscle. That's called the trapezius. Um, but the pressure is going to be back here. So the rider will be forward. The saddle will be moving the pressure back but not past that last rib. We never want to go past that last rib. The Western concept is to bend the front of the saddle down, and that puts us into this muscle right here, which is called the latissimus muscle. And what a lot of these people that follow this idea, they're teaching you to put the saddle back behind the scapula. But if you do that, you're almost out. And that lumbar span has to flex upward to allow the stifle to release. So one of the reasons we're having so many stifle and hock issues in our horses is that we have saddle makers making saddles that are designed to sit too far back. Stifle is gonna to happen to the hock. So the, the stifle can't release and we end up with hock problems. That's fun to know, huh? Mm -hmm. That's sort of interesting. So this is one of my English saddles. It's about six inches wide, which is about how wide, um, that's about how wide the longissimus dorsi muscle is on the horse. So here's a, another fairly typical English saddle. It's only three inches wide in the middle. So that one goes back to the jousting. So, so the three inches wide, that's going back to that idea of kind of taking the weight off of in the center there and having it bridge. Yeah, so um, it's, it's confusing the seat rail with the horse rail is what it's actually doing. So, I mean, throughout history, everybody's confusing everything and one guy does it. I mean, you can tell just the way it is today. There's no clean line to start making stuff one way and it all gets confused. So is the new slide up? Yep, yep, it's there. And so you can see that with all the different pictures you've got there. should be a picture, a picture. Yep. Everybody's forward. Right, didn't matter how they were right. We even got an Indian down here. So I'm building saddles for a lot of different clinicians and their customers. And I find out 
I, I noticed that a lot of the clinicians or some of the clinicians, when their customers would get a saddle, they'd have a ton of trouble. And other clinicians, I'd sell a saddle and there would be no problem. So, hmm. I, you know, this was driving me a little nuts. And it's not very far to go, by the way. <laughs> so I was wondering what was happening. And since I live with a trainer, I thought I would ask her what the deal was. So I, I realized that she trains every horse exactly the same, but completely different. And I realized I understood what she did different. She supports different confirmations in different ways to get the same result. What I didn't realize was what she was actually doing the same. So what, what is the result she was trying to get? So she's coming up for lunch and I grab her and I say, um, Liz, show me what you do to train a horse. And I'm thinking, you fool, you just ask a horse question before you ate lunch. So I'm thinking I'm gonna starve to death before we're done. So, so she says, okay, I want, you, I want you to get on all fours. So I get on all fours. And she didn't. She didn't give me the first one connection to begin with, because that's something she assumes. She assumes that you're going to get permission from the horse to be with it, and um, that you're going to have an emotional bond with the horse before you start doing anything. That's just mm -hmm. assumed in her world. Yeah. So the first thing she says, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure you're straight. And and I said, well, if we've been together this long and you don't know that by now. We, no, anyway, um, I understood what straightness meant because I worked so much with Dr. Deb Bennett. So that basically means keep all four feet weighted, keep the uh, sternum in the center of the two front legs, okay? And this is really, really important. If you don't have straightness, you're not going to get anything else. Yeah. So then she did something and I engaged my hindquarter. I don't know what she did. She made me engage my hindquarter. Then she grabbed my face and she started messing with my face and she got me to lift the base of my neck. Said, okay, now I have you in a weight bearing posture, right? Your hind end is engaged, the base of your neck is lifting. I said, yeah. Then she said, now I'm gonna ask you to move forward in that weight bearing posture. I said, okay, I said, what's next? She says, now I'm gonna ask you to bend through the rib cage. And so she got, she bent me through the rib cage. She said, that's going to be all the lateral work. I said, okay, what's next? She said, that's it. And I said, what do you mean that's it? She said, that's it. Everything else is a different combination of these five things. And I, I, I'm like going, well, you mean there's all these books and all this? And then she says, yeah, I don't know why everybody makes it so complicated. So what this does, this way of thinking about this does, is it's basically getting you to control the curvatures of the spine. So in our horse's spine, we have a kyphosis, upward curve, in the neck, and then it goes to a lordosis, downward curve, and then we have a kyphosis in the lumbar span. So the natural pattern of the curves of the spine are kyphosis, lordosis, kyphosis. That's what this does, is it maintains the natural curvatures of the spine. Over here, we have a Mustang, never been ridden. So I've drawn some lines on these two horses. What we wanna do is find out, um, you know, is this an uphill horse or a downhill horse? So we go to the point of the hip and then we find the widest part of the neck and we draw a little dot and we draw a line. If that line is going downhill, then we have a downhill horse. Most horses are partially downhill. Okay, now, if I take that same line, because this line is kind of an average of all the curves of the spine. If I take that line and I bring it up to the croup, this, this part of the back right here should be touching that upper line, if the horse is using his body right. Now we can look at the, the he's not using his body right. So at D, you'll see it dip in front of the wither. That means his rhomboidus muscle is really tight, okay? We see pockets behind the scapula. Now, a lot of saddle people will tell you to put the saddle in the pocket behind the scapula. Look at our Mustang that's never been ridden or had anything, because this is a wild horse. There's no pockets. 
So this like changed my work. Saddle fitting issues were because the rider was missing one of these essentials. So then I started focusing on helping them with those essentials and a lot of the saddle fitting issues went away. I keep getting this message that says my, so then she taught me these things and I'm kind of getting with it. Um, and I'm noticing that if I start paying attention to these things, we can solve most of the saddle fitting problems without doing anything to the saddle. Okay. So then I'm watching her work a horse one day in the arena. So I have one of these matrix moments where I have to either take the red pill or the blue pill, right? So blue pill, I just ignore what I'm seeing and the story ends and I can go back to believing what I want. But the red pill, I have to completely change how I think about horsemanship. So what's happening is she's in there and she's working this horse and she's going to the face, but the hind end isn't engaged. So I go, whoa, 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 whoa. You gave the five essentials in hind quarter. Lift the base of the neck. Move forward in the weight bearing posture and then bend in the ribs. She says, yeah, but I didn't start this horse. Um, she said, because I didn't start this horse, the base of the neck is dropped. They cannot engage their hindquarter until they get the base of the neck to lift. Okay, so I tried it in my own body and you can get on all fours and do this. If you lift your head and drop the base of your neck and try to engage your hindquarter, you can't do it. So I had this realization that most of the industry is spending most of their horsemanship time trying to fix a horse that was started improperly. They're spending most of their time trying to get the base of the neck pyramid and that it is a protocol that's trying to get the base of the neck back to neutral. Now, all these things are good, all of them are important, but there's better ways to do those things. So normally around here, even if a horse is really messed up, we can get them to collection in about a week. Now, is it pretty and beautiful? No, not yet. But we can get their bodies back to a point where they can actually get collected. So it's a very different idea. In Liz's classical, in Liz's classical world, collection is a baby basic. And it's the foundation of beginning the training. So if you've not if you've not taught the horse how, you pretty much can go right to collection. So just a very different way of looking at it. Um, we're having a fairly rigorous conversation on whether or not you should build saddles crooked with. Um, some of the folks from Schlesa on Facebook right now. So their contention is, is if a horse is crooked, the rider will fall to one side or the other, run arch on the saddle to make the saddle crooked, saying that that will support the rider and allow the rider, that allow the horse to go straight. Well, it won't um, before you ever get on and you need to develop that in the horse before you ever get on. Otherwise, if you make the saddle crooked, it's gonna block it. So straightness is pretty simple. You gotta get the sternum in the center of the two front legs. And if you get that to happen, the horse is gonna have his feet. He's gonna feel like all his feet. So this is a really cool thing to understand about your horse and it's really important to saddle fit. And that is that the horse wants to be automatic. So he has all these reciprocating systems in his body. So a reciprocating system is clamp. So you know how a desk lamp has the springs and all the cables and everything. And when you push on it, it goes into this position and it stays. It can't move on its own. Okay, so that's, that's how a horse is. They have all these ligaments that connect everything to everything else. So each leg has a reciprocating system in it and the spine is a big reciprocating system. So we all pretty much understand that if the feet are out of balance, it'll mess up 
the whole body, right? So we understand that if the feet are off, it'll mess up the body, but it's equally true that if the back is off, it'll mess up the feet. So it works from the ground up and from the back down. So, you know, Liz is a gait expert and where she assesses gait is in the spine because you cannot fake spinal action. You can fake footfalls, but you can't fake spinal dynamics. So true gates happen through spinal dynamics. So that's one of uh, Dr. Bennett's postulates that spinal dynamics govern limb dynamics. So in like natural horsemanship, you'll hear the thing where they say, well, you gotta talk to the feet. And it's this big mystery. Well, it's not a mystery. You talk to the speed the feet by changing the spinal curves. When you can govern the spinal curves by how much you're having them to engage the hindquarter and lift the base of the neck, the feet will go where you want them to go. All right, we're gonna go. Okay, so we got all these reciprocating systems in the body and the spine is suspended by some slings. In the front end, we've got the serrati, we've got the rhomboids, and we've got the pectoral muscles. And these create a big sling for the rib cage to rest in. Um, in the hind end, we have the sacrum and the pelvis. This is the iliac wing of the pelvis. And there's these two flat surfaces that fit together. And the really important joint on both sides. There's no ball, there's nothing like that. It's just like two flat surfaces with some little textured bumps that create that joint. And it is connected with a bunch of ligaments. These little yellow, this yellow area, those are ligaments. If we ride the horse upside down, we stretch these ligaments, meaning that the lumbar span isn't flexing up and the hind end isn't engaging. We can flex those ligaments, the sacrum will drop, then we'll get a bump called a hunter's bump up here in the spine because this is dropped. Okay, these can go crooked and then you have a real mess. You have a perpetually crooked horse. And if they're crooked, they can't lift the base of their neck and engage their hindquarter. Okay, so here's the forelimb reciprocating system. So all these yellow things are ligaments. Here's the scapula. There's a big and it fans out onto the ribs of the horse. It also fans up into the cervical section. So it's a big fan of muscles. That's the main thing that supports the horse's rib cage. We would as we can. So if we, you know, if we want to sit right back here, um, we got to really move that saddle forward. And that means we got to keep it off the scapula too. So we're going to open up the front, put it on contact through the middle, and then we're going to open up the back. So that is um, the Eastern way of doing it. And that's really anatomically the only correct way of doing it uh, in terms of the biomechanics. Um, so this is the reciprocating system of the hind end. This is the stifle joint and there's a hook on the bone. Uh, let me get my pointer. Uh, there's my pointer. There's a hook on the bone right here. These ligaments go over the top of that hook and that's how they lock their hind leg, okay? In order to get that to release, in order that to get that to lift up off the hook, this part of the back has got to flex upward because these systems are all tied together. So the hind end ties directly into the uh, lumbar area of our horse. So I was given this presentation at a, one of the big equine marketing groups and one of the ladies had just been to their main thing out in Colorado and she got beat red when I was talking about this. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, I was just out at their place. And all their horses are having hawk problems and they can't figure out why. Well, the head of this marketing group sells saddles that are designed to sit way back here. He teaches them that you want to be able to reach around and touch the horse's point of hip. So the saddle that he's designed and the way he's teaching people to ride 
are creating hock problems in all his horses. When we look at a horse, um, we often think, okay, front end, body, hind end, how are the systems working in the body? So it's a different perspective. So we've got all our vertebra, and then we have these bones that stick up. These are called spinal processes. Where one of them stands straight up and down, that's called the anticlinal vertebra. And this is important because you'll hear saddle fitters and stuff talk about this a lot. Two ribs, they start leaning forward. So the last two ribs I view as part of the lumbar span. So when fitting a saddle, if I can keep the saddle forward of the last two ribs, I'm going to do it. I very seldom can. Usually you just don't have that. All right, so what I did, you know, I'm asking the question, how much room, how much bearing surface do we really have on our horse's back? So I went out in the backyard and I measured some of the horses that we had here. And it's a pretty good range of breeds. And um, we ended up with an average of about 20 inches from the back of the scapula to the last rib. Here's the great debate. Traditionally, we had the saddle forward. We opened up the front so the scapula could pass underneath and we kept it off the lumbar span. Today, there's some confusion about this anticlinal vertebra. The Western guys are saying that if you take a ball and you put it on your horse's back, it will roll to the lowest point and that's where the anticlinal vertebra is. And you should center the seat on that anticlinal vertebra. Now, they're taking the lead from some stuff that Hillary Clayton has said. And Hillary Clayton does some fabulous work out of the University of Michigan. But what she's saying is you want to be around T14, which is one rib past the lowest point of the wither. She's calling that the anticlinal moment. Okay, That's a very different concept. And the moment is where two angles change. It's that point where the two angles change. So the Western guys kind of got that confused and they're saying that the low point of the back is way back here. Well, this point of the back, the lumbar span, is supposed to be the highest point of the back. So, you know, I'm online and I get in these arguments with these guys and they're talking about rolling this ball on the back and that it should go to the anticlinal vertebra and I'm like going, what? Um, <laughs> and then of course I show them the anatomy and they, they send me death threats and things like that. Um, <laughs> They, seriously, I've been threatened to be beat up because of this. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> so then they put pictures of their horses up, and they're right. The way they're riding the horses, the the anticlinal vertebra is the lowest point of the back, but that means it's a dysfunctional back. That means they've literally broken the horse's back. Hmm. So that's sad. Um, so one of the big debates that we have in the saddle community, and I'm having this with the Schleses on uh, Shea Stewart's list right now, um, is whether or not as a professional, when we go out to see your horse, should we just fit the horse you have? Or do we have a responsibility to let you know there's something wrong with your horse? Now, when I talk to my customers, almost all of them will say, well, yeah, you should tell me the saddle fitting community and the saddle making community's basic consensus is that that's not their problem. That if you have a crooked horse, they'll just make the saddle to fit. Mm. Is oftentimes these issues can be resolved very simply. Sometimes all you have to do is lift one rein higher than the other. And if we build the saddle to fit that posture, it locks it in place. So what I like people to do is to go out and actually measure. You know, here's some of the measurements you can take. I did this with a group of pony clubbers in all because the deal was we, we got a hold of the pony clubbers in advance and we sent them the sheet and we had them all go measure their horses. And they all realized that it was impossible to do what the saddle fitters are telling you to do. That you can't stay off the lumbar span. You can on some, because we have huge variations out there. But on most horses, that's impossible. So 
kind of an interesting perspective. So I want to talk a little bit more about the dorsal ligament because it runs all the way from the head all the way back to the tail. And when we ask our horse to engage its hindquarter, this comes down, it pulls on this cable. Because these are leaning forward, it lifts this part of the back and it makes the lumbar, the anticlinal vertebra, the highest point of the back. Then in our lumbar area, these are leaning back. Okay, so it's this mechanism back here that lifts the front end. So we want to let this mechanism do its job. So we want to sit forward of that and it will lift us with them. Our horses bend and the spine bends. So this middle line would be the horse standing straight. Okay, this is where most people are teaching you to fit your horse in that straight position. So I got these lines off of some research that Hillary Clayton had done. So when they bend to the right, they bend this much. When they bend to the left, they bend that much. Okay, this is about where the scapula ends. This is um, about, you know, we're going to be sitting somewhere in this area. Okay, so when I build that saddle, I've got to build this movement in. If I don't build that movement in, I'm fitting this. And when your horse goes to bend, he's not going to be able to bend. So very important. That's why you want a very open front and then you want to get pressure back here because back here, there's not as much bend. Okay, does anybody have any questions on this stuff? Yeah, let's know what, what you got there. Um, so with, I mean, that's all really, really fascinating, you know, just, just knowing kind of the history and where where everything comes from that's always really important so what what are you know a few things that you know i want people to leave with something really practical to say hey i you know i need to really watch out for these things so what are a few things that uh, people can really kind of keep in mind when they're saddling or when they're when they're looking for a new saddle that sort of thing just practical basis that's great okay so now we're going to talk about how a saddle works okay now we've kind of learned what the horse has to be doing and we've learned some of the history so we've got four systems we've got a tree system a rigging system a seating system a skirting system all saddles have a tree you know, we have this idea of treeless saddles out there, but they have a tree, it's just flexible. So we have flexible trees. So most of the saddles that we're calling flexible trees are really just barless and they still have a rigid part on the saddle. So when you go to fit a saddle, the first thing you're looking for is the hardest part of the saddle. And does that hard part have the right shape to fit your horse? Because if it's hard, and it's not the right shape for your horse, it's gonna cause a problem, okay? So that's, that's the basics of the tree system. The rigging system is what we're gonna tie the saddle onto the horse with. Okay, so I want you to think of your saddle like a rocking chair, where the chair doesn't rock, but the floor does. We have three different configurations that we can tie the saddle onto the horse so that the pressure stays in the middle. So the first configuration, English saddles usually have this kind of configuration. So if you have an English saddle and it's got the billets, but the billets are too far forward, what's going to happen? It's going to drive the front arch into the horse's body and it's going to make the back of the saddle bounce up and down. Then it will start swinging from side to side and you'll start getting a girth call. Okay. Another way we can tie it on is if we create a triangle from the front of the saddle to the back of the saddle and pull down on the point the pressure is going to go to where the area of that triangle is divided in half. So on Western saddles, we call that a flat plate rigging. Um, you'll see it on some dressage saddles where you'll have a billet coming from the back and one from the front. So very, these are all effective. These all work. Okay, on a double rig saddle, a double rig configuration, the front and rear cinch are supposed to be equally tight. If you don't have the rear cinch tight, well, it's going to bounce up and down. Then it becomes a big lever on a loop and it causes girth calls. Okay. So I think we should just move to questions because um, the internet's going to get really bad right now. 
Okay. Well, cool. So Leslie has a question from Wisconsin and she says, you made my, sa my horse's saddle. It's wonderful. My question is about the age of the horse. Is there an age when you recommend that the owner invest in a saddle being crafted for their horse after the horse has developed and changed through any uh, extremes or the investment is the is best timed okay um, the best time to order the saddle is about six years of age uh, if you're gonna be okay so let's talk about growth plates the horse is born uh, the bones have cartilage on the end of the bone and that turns into bone as it grows. So that's what we call a growth plate. It's just cartilage. So they are, the, those cartilage things on the end of the bone close from the ground up first. So from birth to three, three and a half, they're closing vertically or horizontally and then in the spine, the growth plates in the spine don't close until five and a half to six. So six is a pretty good time. Now they may muscle up more. The saddle should allow for that. You should be able to have enough variance. If you fit the saddle right, using the Eastern method, the muscling variations should not make a big difference. So did that answer the question? Yeah, I, th I think so. So kind of back to the, you know, what, what, what can people, you know, do with all of this information now and, and when, the, when they're out there with their horse, what, what do you recommend for them to kind of keep an eye out for when they're, when they're putting their saddle on, when they're fitting, that sort of thing? Okay, um, let me, I'm gonna move to one new slide. Okay, so we got, Walker, striker, and he's fairly narrow. So when I put a saddle on him, the, most of the saddles aren't going to fit him because they're too flat. Um, this is Buns. She's an old quarter horse, and she's really extremely downhill. She's got a really well sprung rib cage. So when we put a like a normal quarter horse saddle on her, it puts pressure here. So what we do we want the scapula to be free right under where we're sitting is where we want the pressure. And then as, as we go to the back, we want it to flare up again. What you, all you really need to know is keep the pressure in the middle under where you're sitting. And so you're gonna do that with the shape. And if the shape is wrong, and you're gonna do it with the rigging, which, which we did explain. And it, it's really that simple. So, so in the, you're, you're looking to keep keep the weight in between the two black lines that you have, the vertical lines? Uh, I don't know what, I think they're pointing to something up here. Oh, okay, so they're From not. The, okay, so here we can see on this horse, here's where the trapezius ties in, and then we can find the last rib. So it's right in this area about like that. Okay. Is where we keep the weight. That's going to keep, but we're going to try and sit as far forward as we can. So the saddle's actually got to move the weight back. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. So let's say you have a saddle that's bridging a bit. Do, do you shim it? Um, yes. So... So like on buns here, almost any saddle is going to bridge just because she's so downhill. So we're going to get pressure here. We're going to get pressure there. So we're going to stick a bunch of foam right in here. And then that's going to lift the pressure off where we don't want it. So the basic rule is put the foam or the padding where you want the pressure. Don't put any more foam where you want, the, where, where you have pressure. Okay, so that's okay. different because most of the pad companies are trying to sell you on shock absorption, but we're, normally I would 
demonstrate myself hitting myself in the head here. Um, and then the idea of cushioning the hit versus just getting rid of the hit. So yeah. the idea is that you make the shapes compatible and then you don't have to worry about concussion. Yeah. So you, so what I'm hearing then is you really want to have the, the front end kind of open so you're off of the, the scapula and then lift it off the back. The rear needs to be kind of off a little so you're not digging down into the lumbar area. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so the other thing that's happening is, of course, the back isn't static when you're moving. It's going up and down because yeah. that's just how they work. Yeah. So what happens is you're, as the horse gets into a better weight bearing posture, the bearing surface gets smaller. So and this happens in every stride. As they take a stride forward, the back drops a bit. So the bearing surface increases as they come and collect up again in each stride, the size of the bearing surface is getting larger and smaller. Yeah. Cool, that's really, really interesting. And then, you know, so what you're saying too is try to, in the rigging part of it is, is try to get the rigging a little bit more back so it's not right up under their legs. Right, now this, often means that the cinch is going to be right where your leg is. Um, and a lot of people don't like that, but we can't really solve the problems any other way. So if you get, and they'll feel what you're doing with your leg through a cinch. Remember, they can feel a fly, mm -hmm. like it's, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, some of the give and take you have to have. Do you really want to open up your horse? Well, then you got to live with a, a bit of cinch on your foot. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's another question from Cindy. Um, uh, she has, she said she has two gated horses with different saddle fitting issues. One horse has a very straight back, so most saddles have uh, too much rock. Any suggestions? The other horse needs more flare at the shoulders. Can these issues be helped with pads or special shims? Yes. So your first situation is like Dreiker here. Dreiker is a Tennessee walker and he is not of old foundation blood. He's got more angle to his ribs. So you usually need to do a shim that looks like this red area right here. Okay, because most bars are going to be too flat and the body is too narrow, so you just fill in the difference. Um, very common on almost all horses that they have not opened up the front of the tree enough. So you take a shim that's tapered in the front. Actually, let me, I've got a picture of those and that should be easy to transfer because it's a shorter. Okay, I'll, I'll use this shim here. So you'll, they're usually too tight in the front, right? So where you wanna open it up, you put the thin area there. The thicker area will be in the middle of the saddle. The front of the saddle is a triangle. When you lift that triangle up, it'll get wider. So you lift it up from the middle by putting the foam in the middle. So this will take the pressure off the front. It'll take the pressure off the back. And then it'll kind of put that pressure in that little triangle area you were showing in the last picture. Yes. Yeah, trapezoid area, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, that makes sense. So what, is there, is there anything yeah, else? It, it's, you know, just use common sense because that'll yeah. go a long way with horses. Yeah, it sure, sure does, sure does. Well, this has been really fascinating, uh, Dave. Where can people get a hold of you if they wanna wanna get in touch with you? Uh, Aboutthehorse.com. Okay, and that should have... be easy to remember. Yeah, I actually, yeah. actually, so to give you the story behind that, when I was getting into this. I saw a lot of stuff happening in the industry and I asked myself, well, what is this really about? And so I named the company about the horse so I would never forget what it's about. So when I answer the phone, I say about the horse. So 
I won't forget that I, you know, because we all have ego and sometimes those egos get away from us <laughs> and we stop serving the need that we really need to serve. So that's yeah. why I named it about the horse. That's awesome. Well, that's really awesome. Um, so do you have any, any upcoming events or something that if somebody wanted to come out and see you? Um, I'll be at the Minnesota Horse Expo. I've got a clinic in Winstead, Minnesota this weekend. And then the following weekend, I will be at North Dakota State University uh, doing a two-day clinic. Well, awesome, Dave. Thanks for everything. And, and for all of you, again, just thank you for, for joining in. Um, We'll see, I, I do, did record this, so I'll see how the recording turns out, and um, and we'll get it out to everybody. So, thanks again, Dave. Sure, appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, really appreciate the time and effort you put into getting this pulled together. No problem. And thank everybody for taking the time to listen. Yeah, appreciate well, it. Well, go out there and ride your ponies. <laughs>